Elizabeth, pleasure to welcome you, Ruth, for being with us. Uh, we're going to have her lecture for 40 minutes and 20 minutes, um, depending on the time, on for questions and questions and answers. Yes. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks to the center and especially to Deepika, who has been planning this visit for years. Uh, also to Oishik and to Kavya Kartik for her work organizing it. Um, my last two books have had courtesans at the center, and I've just finished a novel set in 18, an 18th century kotha, and that will appear in English from Penguin next year, and in Hindi from Raj Kamal. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the important role that courtesans have played in shaping Indian modernity. Do we have that thing? Um, so in Same Sex Love in India, which came out in 2000, uh, Kidwai and I argued that British rule uh, destroyed several Indian sexual and social institutions. So after that work, I wanted to find out like what were those institutions like. And so this, in my 2012 book, Gender, Sex, and the City, was an attempt to study one pre-modern literary culture. And I found that it could actually be termed modern. Uh, so that's my argument in the book, that Indian modernity is not the product of colonialism, as we are often taught. But there was an indigenous modernity in pre-colonial cities like Lucknow. Uh, this modernity was shaped by many people, including courtesans and poets. Um, it dis and when I say modernity, it displayed many markers of modernity, such as hybridity, uh, linguistic, religious, regional, and international hybrid hybridity, proto-consumerism, and gender and sexual diversities. Um, now, this type of modernity was overtaken by a different type of colonial modernity, but it didn't altogether disappear. Um, after the 1857 rebellion was crushed, when the crown took over the rule of India, the new rulers initiated a series of laws to regulate sexuality. So that includes 377, but it also includes laws to regulate courtesans. Um, they termed them, of course, notch girls from Nachnevali and equated them with sex workers, uh, which they weren't. They were not sex workers. Um, more importantly, educated Indian urban men, both Hindu and Muslim, began to remake themselves in the image of the conquerors, uh, which, we, which we and several other historians have argued. Along with English education, Indian men internalized a deeply puritanical suspicion of pleasure, pleasure in general, and embarrassment regarding sex in general, and specifically any type of sex that was not heterosexual, monogamous, marital sex. Um, so Indian urban male elites, both Hindu and Muslim, grew ashamed of their cultural heritage. Um, Hindus of the supposed licentiousness and obscenity of what British missionaries termed what polytheism. Um, in fact, these characterizations of Hinduism as obscene continue even on missionary websites even today. Uh, I've checked recently. And Muslims grew ashamed of the supposed decadence and obscenity of Persian and Urdu poetry, which celebrated erotic love and wine and earthly pleasure. Uh, now, this, what happens is a certain cleaning up of the canon towards the end of the 19th century. Uh, this type of poetry was either removed from the canon or it was reinterpreted as purely mystical. I may be going over ground you already are familiar with, but I just want to give the background. Uh, this happened both in Hindi and in Urdu and in other languages. Um, so social reform movements such as the Arya Samaj, the Brahmo Samaj, etc., they made anti-notch campaigns, so anti-courtesan campaigns central to their agenda uh, in newspapers like the Indian Social Reformer. Uh, they attacked the livelihood of courtesans by asking the wealthy not to give up the tradition of having courtesans perform. There was a tradition of courtesans performing at birthdays, at wedding parties, etc., and they said, no, we should not do this, and there was this attack on spending money on, this, this, this goes back a long way, this idea that we shouldn't be having display, we shouldn't be having enjoyment we should be I don't know what we should be doing but yeah saving the money for saving the money and I guess building up business or whatever nationalists of all stripes continued this attack and sometimes they used a sort of proto-feminist rhetoric to characterize courtesans as exploited victims but they also depict so it's simultaneously saying that they are exploited victims but also depicting them as corrupting influences on society because of their erotic performance traditions and also because of their extramarital relations with men um, so the government of independent India reinforced and added to the anti-courtesan laws which were passed by the British rulers. Uh, now we all know that this resulted in several institutions being criminalized and going underground and these institutions include same-sex relations, poly polygamy, polyandry and also courtesan sexuality. Um, I, sh I wrote an essay on, Indi in India, on India at the Fin de Siegle uh, and I showed that British administrators like W.H. Sleeman who was the resident at Lucknow in the first part of the 19th century, he was the one who first used the word decadent or one of the first to use the word decadent to characterize Indian rulers at the turn of the 18th century uh, because they said that rulers Rulers like the Nawabs of Lucknow were decadent because they were surrounded by women, by poets. This is what he actually says, surrounded by women, by poets, and by eunuchs. And that's his term. Uh, and 
a century later, the same term decadent would be used to denigrate British artists like uh, Wilde, for example. Uh, so as I read 18th century literature about courtesans, both in verse and prose, I found that these women were central figures in urban culture, not just in Lucknow, but also in other cities like Banaras, Hyderabad, Mysore, Agra, Kolkata, and Delhi. Um, these women were both Hindu and Muslim. They worked in the public sphere, sharing patrons and forums with male poets. Uh, they were artists themselves. They were friends and colleagues of male poets and literati. And uh, in this literature, particular type of sexual relationships and particular types of sexualities emerge. Uh, these were the only women who lived in serial monogamy. Uh, later in their lives, some of them became junior wives of kings, of nobility, of wealthy businessmen. But the point about them is that they were different from sex workers because they didn't just uh, have sex with any man for cash. They actually, there was a whole uh, sort of uh, uh, etiquette around how these relationships were structured. And basically, what it, it was what we can now call serial monogamy. Uh, but more important and interesting to me, and often overlooked, is the fact that courtesans had non sexual friendships with men. So even after they were having a relationship with one man, at the same time, they did not go into parda. And that's the difference from wives. Um, th when they were with this one man, they didn't go into parda. They continued to meet other men and have conversations with them. Uh, so they were the, uh, they were the female intellectuals of the time, and they are actually praised by name by many male poets at the time. And some of the names uh, are Chapla Bai, Dulhanjan, Azizan, etc. Actual women's names are. Um, and I have uh, argued in the book that the courtesans sang and danced some of, some of the poems uh, written by the male poets, uh, especially Sarapa or Nakshik Varnan, which is the head to toe to praise of a beautiful person. Uh, at the time, a beautiful person with whether female or male, was called a pari, uh, very, one of the words. Uh, so an example is Nazirak Barabadi of Agra. He wrote a poem called Pari Ka Sarapa. Uh, but there are many such, written by many poets. This is just one example. Uh, in the film Mandi, if you have seen that, and that's on the cover of my book, um, Atawaif performs a sarapa, and there it is on the side. I, I don't know what to do with this thing. Performs, uh, Atawaif performs a sarapa by, written by Bahadur Shah Zafar. And it's an actual poem from the time. Um, the poems ca now these poems carried the poet's name of course and the signature line. So that was what I would I have characterized as mutual advertising. Um, the poet is praising the courtesan, and she, by pra performing the poem, is advertising her own skills, but also his skills for writing the poem. Right. Uh, I just wanted to do a little detour. Uh, today, courtesans tend to be sort of exoticized as Asian or non-Western. In fact, they were very prominent in modern Europe too. This is a very little known fact. They lived uh, in Europe either with attendants or in mat matrilineal households with sisters and mothers. And many of these women have left written records of their lives. Um, in England, uh, can we change it? Um, courtesans lived quite openly up to the first half of the 19th century. This is an English woman called Harriet Wilson, 1786 to 1845. Uh, she was one of four courtesan sisters, and she was the lover of many statesmen, including Duke Wellesley, uh, who led the Battle of Seringapatnam against the Sultan. So it's contemporary, a bit the, in the 18th century. 18th, huh? She was a contemporary of Jane Austen, so you can change it. She published her memoirs in 1825, and her memoir was a bestseller, and it went into 30 editions. Now, you can take a look at this extract from a letter she wrote to the Crown Prince, and look at the witty and confident tone in which she writes to him. And this is what was attractive about courtesans. I think both in India and the West, they sort of talk to men in this witty, semi-erotic, playful, but very confident, and face-to-face, -face, they don't they don't pull any punches when talking. So you can just see the way she talks to him. Why should I come all the way to meet you? Are you any different from any other man? Do you have any more fingers, toes, or any other parts than any other man? So why should I come to meet you? Uh, Emma Hamilton, next one, 1764. 5 to 1815. She worked as a maid. Uh, she had many jobs. She worked as a maid. She worked as a model. She worked as a courtesan. She used to perform erotic dances at parties. And she developed theatrical spectacles for her various lovers, guests. Finally, she married Lord Hamilton. So this is how you can see the progress of a courtesan for that when, when they've done with this career, then they marry somebody in a high position. She became a friend of several queens. And then she fell in love with Lord Nelson. Uh, who you know who he was, right? She lived openly with him and her husband in a menage a trois. So this is 19th century, right? So at the same time as the British are kind of, this, in the first half of the 19th century, the British are okay with courtesans in India because this is what they are used to there, right? But it's uh, in the second half of the 19th century, after 1857, there's a kind of crackdown in India, but also <coughs> in the West. 
uh, in England. But France, of course, France continues its erotic tradition a little later than England and was more liberal than England in some respects later. So uh, I'll give you another example. French erotic dancer and courtesan, Liane de Pougy, 1869 to 1950. So she lived into the 20th century. She wrote her memoirs and she wrote, and uh, this is still Emma Hamilton, but the next one. She wrote a 1901 a no a novel in 1901 titled Ideal Safik. And this book, this is a novel, but it recorded her affair with American writer <coughs> Natalie Barney. Uh, that's Natalie, uh, and that's the two of them, who was a transplant. Uh, Natalie Barney was a transplant from America to Paris, where she lived openly as a lesbian. And Dipuji, the courtesan, later married a prince, and after her son died, she became a nun. So if you look at her life, the number of things she did. Okay, she lived with men, she lived with women, she became a, married a prince, she became a nun. So she has done, like, everything in her life. Um, now, in the Victorian period, 19th century, early 20th, uh, worldwide you have a decline of princes, of nobility, and of courts. Courtesans, of course, as you can tell from the name courtesan, are connected to courts. So they lose their patronage and they gradually disappear. In India, courtesans uh, lived not, now these women whom examples I gave you, they are sort of living as individual adventurers. Uh, in India, it's much more well organized because there's a longer uh, organized tradition. They lived in well organized uh, households. But my point in showing you the European ones is that, which I haven't studied in detail, so I'm just giving you some examples, is that this was a cultural phenomenon common to the European colonizing societies and the colonized Indian society. Um, so when they're, they're calling Indian courtesans the same as sex workers, they are also being in denial of their own past and their own history. Um, now, courtesans, in a way, in India, uh, were, were a kind of gender crossover, one could say, in some ways, uh, which some uh, commentators have mentioned. They were like men in being primary earners and in sleeping with more than one man. Uh, Vina Oldenburg found that courtesans were the only women in the highest income tax bracket in 19th century Lucknow. They owned houses and land in their own names. And as you can see from this picture, they dressed modestly. This is important, because very often in movies, they are shown the, the courtesans, the dancers are shown uh, later, not earlier movies, but later movies, or 80s onwards, are shown as being very much in a state of semi undress. But that's not true. They fully covered their bodies, just their faces were exposed. They fully covered the bosses' face, faces, hands, and feet were exposed. Um, their charm consisted in, now, and the interesting thing is most of them are not conventionally beautiful, what was considered conventionally beautiful. They were not. Their charm consisted more in witty conversation and artistic skill. Um, for example, Captain Williamson in the 1780s wrote about Kanum Jan, who was the leading courtesan in Lucknow. He said she was ugly, filthy, haughty, and black, but she had many young British officers at her feet because of the grace of her movements and the novelty of her Kashmiri songs. Okay, so... Uh, another stereotype is that all Tawafs were Muslim. This is incorrect. It, go to the next one. In the second half of the 19th century, uh, this is a, just a household. Um, go to the next, yeah. In the second half of the 19th century, there were, for example, uh, two Hindu courtesans in Banaras, Vidyadhari and Rajeshwari. Uh, they are mentioned that they were studying the Kama Sutra with a Brahmin scholar, Goswami Damodar Lal. Um, later in the 19th century, a Hindi poet of Banaras praised a, praised a courtesan named Saraswati, comparing her to Apsara. And I, she said, Rambharati ki kaha hai gati, jaha Aap Saraswati Nath Rahi. Okay, you understand. What standing do Rambha and Rathi have when Saraswati herself dances? That was her name. Uh, Fifty years earlier, another poet, Beni, had praised another Banarsi courtesan, saying, uh, she said, Til bhar tulti nahi telotama rang se roop sawai hai. Hai, hai Rathi ka ruth, Rathi kaha urvashi bhi sun sharmai hai. Sun taan par hote hai galtaan sur... Surtan Sen ki pai hai, nar na har ke drig ki putri uh, kashi mein tokhi bai hai. Okay, so Tilotama can't compare at all, the Apsara Tilotama. She is more beautiful and lovely. As great as Rati, no, not Rati, even Urvashi feels ashamed. Hearing that sound of her voice, all wallow in bliss, she has Tan Sen's voice. The apple of the eye of the lion among men, and that's the Maharaja of Banaras, is tokhi bai of Banaras. Um, so Sab Sabadivan has a recent book, The Wife Nama, in which he looks at the courtesans of Banaras many years later, late 19th, early 20th centuries. But I think a rich field for exploration for anyone to do if you're looking for a research topic is the institution of courtesans in Banaras and other Hindu kingdoms, Orcha, for example, in the 17th and 18th centuries. Ha this has not been studied as far as I know. Um, Okay, so courtesans also, I, I mentioned they lived in serial monogamy, they had friendships with men. They also often had relationships with other women, as Oldenburg has shown, but as I've also found in the poetry of the time. And uh, that makes perfect sense, because the longest term relationships they would have would be in their own household where they were living. Uh, so therefore, they represent a kind of sexual hybridity and fluidity that is characteristic of urban areas, and courtesans are very much an urban phenomenon, not a rural one. Um, uh, okay, I'll skip over some of 
this about men and so on. And uh, courtesans, as we know, their most important contribution was developing and transmitting classical music and dance, performing in mehfils, just as male poets did, and later, of course, in theater and cinema. Uh, Sophia Plowden, I, one of many European women who, she, who recorded courtesan songs in the late 18th, early 19th centuries, she recorded them in a beautifully illuminated man manuscript uh, with illustrations um, in the late 18th century. And at this time, there was a rage for courtesan music among Europeans, and they used to try to learn these songs. So uh, Catherine Butler Schofield is working to bring out a published edition of this manuscript. I've seen the manuscript in the Fitzwilliam Library at Cambridge. It's really amazing. In 1783, Sophia Plowden and her friends, they dressed and performed as courtesan troupe. They dressed up as a courtesan troupe and performed at a party in Calcutta, a British party. So this shows you that in the 18th and early 19th centuries, the British were quite happy, not only happy with courtesan, but actually sort of admiring them because the imitation is the best form of flattery, the sales form of flattery, right? They are modeling themselves on them. But uh, so uh, from the fourth century Sanskrit drama onwards, courtesans were often depicted as romantic heroines in Indian literature. Uh, there's a scholar called Sanjay Gotham, I don't know if you've come across his book, he has written about uh, courtesans, he's written a book about courtesans as synonymous with romantic heroines in Sanskrit drama. A very good point. He makes the point that when you say naika uh, in Sanskrit drama, it, uh, it means the heroine, but it also means a performer who is very often a courtesan. And, and uh, the naika is also a word used as late as the 18th century for the head of the kota. I found this in the poetry of the time, that the head of the kota, the woman, is known as the naika, the leader. So it has, uh, it has more than one meaning, that word. Uh, this tradition is also evident in ancient Tamil poetry, that is the courtesan as heroine, uh, in medieval Sanskrit poetry, in Telugu, Urdu, and Hindu po Hindi poetry. And some of these poems end with the courtesan marrying the hero. Uh, this, is, this reflects real life. For example, Begum Hazrat Mahal, uh, uh, she was the junior wife of Wajid Ali Shah. Uh, he had many wives, so she was one of his junior wives, and she was the wife before she married him. She, as you know, led the 1857 rebels in Lucknow. You can go to the next, in the name of her 11-year-old year son, Birgit. Now, this type of happy ending, where so-called happy ending, where she marries the courtesan, marries the hero or the nobleman, this, of course, becomes very common later in films, right? But on the other hand, uh, what, what doesn't, what is not shown is in films is another type of happy ending, and that is the ending, uh, there are two, three types. One is the ending in which the courtesan becomes a nun or a, a, a sadhvi. That is sometimes shown in films. But she becomes a Buddhist nun. There's a Tamil epic called Mani Mekhlai, ancient Tamil epic, and in which she becomes a Buddhist nun at the end, right? Uh, this, uh, a third type of happy ending is found in a late 18th century poem called Khaja Hasan or Bakshi Tawaif. This was written by Sheikh Alandar Baksh Jurrat, 1748 to 1810, uh, whom I wrote, I wrote about this poem in Gender, Sex and the City. And this poem narrates the romance between Jurrat's friend, who was a poet called Hazrat, and a courtesan at the wife named Bakshi. Now, this, of course, everyone's heard of Umrao Janada, and I'm so fed up of it because nobody can ever get beyond it. Uh, but this romance, to me, is much more interesting. It's definitely based on real-life events. In the case of Umrao Janada, we don't know if she was a fictional or real character. In this one, she definitely is based on real events, uh, the poet's own friend. Uh, it's, uh, Jurath praises Bakshi. It's written in verse, and he praises her, and he says she's a beautiful woman, but she has a man's strength and courage. Uh, he also compares her to both Saraswati and Tansen, just as the Banaras poets do. And now this kind of characterization, it puts her in a category which is both masculine and feminine, and also a category of her own. That is a kind of unique category. I've translated parts of this poem in Gender, Sex and the City. Um, now, Jurat's friend, the poet Hazrat, he meets uh, Bakshi because she's one of the... Am I saying things you'd know? Am I repeating stuff you know? No. No. Okay. Jurat's, Jurat's friend, who is the poet Hazrat, how does he meet the courtesan? He meets Bakshi because she is one of the beautiful people, Khuba, the beautiful people of the city. So I'm, I'm yeah, this using an English term, which is actually Khuba really means the beautiful ones. And he loves beauty. So he goes in search, and it's a kind of mystical search, where you search for beautiful people as a stepping stone to the beauty of divine beauty. But uh, where does he go to search for beautiful people? The obvious place to go to is the Kota, right? And he goes there, and he's interested in beauty beauty, not in a particular gender. And this is very much as earlier societies understood desire, not just this one, but ancient Greek and remain many societies. So I'll just read, he loved the company of beautiful people, Kuba, whether women or male youth, Amrath is the word for Amrath, Amrath, 
for male youth. So he loved all of them, all beautiful people. It's true that one acquainted with God's truth always desires those with beautiful faces. He was much given to worship of beautiful witnesses, Shahid Parasti. Uh, Hazrat had a great taste for outings, Sair. So he's obviously having fun as well. It's not just a mystical thing, but he's, having, he's going on Sair. Wherever beautiful faces and flower-like bodies were to be found, he stayed there from morning till evening, which means that he's staying in the Kota from morning till evening. So the two of them fall in love, and it's a long story, but summing up, they start spending all their time together. The Naika, who's the head of the Kota, she doesn't like this because her earnings are dwindling and these two are, she's not spending time with anyone else. So she separates them. When she separates them, they both start pining and languishing and almost dying, just like most romances. When Bakshi is very, the courtesan is very close to death, then the Naika says, I can't let her die. So she allows them to reunite. But now the interesting point to me is the last, the ending, because unlike a typical romance that we are used to from <laughs> movies and stories and so on, novels, this one doesn't end in marriage. It could have ended in marriage, but it doesn't. Instead, what happens is that Hazrat, the poet, once more begins to visit the Kota. Their mutual love continued to grow. Once again, he regularly came and went. Ana jana lagaraha. So he keeps coming and going to the Kota. She's still living in the Kota, okay? Allah made them both happy. Look at the use of Allah there. So he doesn't consider it wrong to talk, say that Allah is arranging this whole thing. Allah made them both happy. Those who were hypocrites now accepted the results. Mile apas me phir mashuk or ashik. So he's using those very charged words, mashuk or ashik, for them, which in the mystical context. Lover and beloved met once more. Just, and the last lines are very nice, just as God gave them happiness, may the whole world get happiness. So once again, that the wife is being used as a model of the ideal beloved uh, and let all of us model ourselves on that and get happiness and love of this kind. Now this could never happen in the 20th century. You would never say uh, in a film or anywhere that let all of us have love just as that the wife had love. On the contrary, as you know from uh, Pakiza, the unfortunate uh, <laughs> element of it, she, her whole thing is castigating herself and saying she was, she's like a dead body wandering around and things like that. Yeah, so you see in a hundred years, it's only a hundred years, this much shift in attitudes. Like, uh, so it is said that Hazrat, Hazrat really was a poet. He was a historically attested poet. After that, after this, he always added Bakshi's name to his own in his poem. So when he signs the poems on the signature line, he puts Bakshi's name along with his own Hazrat. And that kind of suggests that she co-wrote the poems. Uh, now, uh, my question, so after gender, after working on gender, sex, and the city, my question was, okay, so after 1857, the courtesan's voice, what happens to that voice? Does it survive? If so, where does it survive? Uh, of course, it survived in one sense in music and dance, in Tumri, for example. But what about at a mass popular level? So go on. In Dancing with the Nation, which is uh, 2017, I argue that the witty, playful, erotic voice of the courtesan moves into Bombay film songs. That's the way in which it gets to be transmitted at a mass level. Though most people may not realize it, that that's what it is. But a lot of the songs in, in um, Mohammed movies are, uh, and I'll go on to uh, talk about uh, how this happens. So from the mid 19th to the mid 20th century, as the patronage is dwindling for courtesans, for Tawaiyas, the more fortunate and more skilled ones move into theater, first Parsi theater as you know, and later into cinema, right? So what I argue in this book is that Courtesans were arguably the first group of modern women, and they shaped cinema, which is the most modern art form, by bringing the erotic into it, but also, by more importantly, by bringing an image of woman into it that is different from that of the conventional film heroine. Um, if, uh, just to give you a little background on cinema, as you may know, the wife lineages are very deeply embedded in the DNA of Bombay cinema. Uh, Jaddan Bai, mother of Nargis, and uh, no, this is not this Gorjan, but uh, Jaddan Bai, mother of Nargis and grandmother of Sanjay Dutt, was the daughter of courtesan Dalit Bai of Allahabad. So this is the lineage when I say the courtesan lineage. She herself was a pioneer in Bombay cinema. She worked as an actor, as a singer, as a music composer, director, and producer of films. Um, if you, uh, when I teach a course on Indian cinema, uh, the cinema textbooks often wrongly list middle class women like Sai Paranspai as the first women directors. This is absolutely wrong. In fact, the first woman film director was Fatma Begum, that's her, an actress in silent films. She launched a production company in her own name and she made eight silent films. Okay, so this is not a, a, a fly by night thing, it's a real career. Okay. Um, 
she was from a Tawai family. Uh, Big Bo was another lady. She was an actor, singer, and music director in the 30s and 40s. She was the daughter of courtesan Hafizan Bai of Delhi. Uh, others, of course, Gohar Jan, Zora Bai, Ambale Wali, Amir Bai, Karnataki, and of course, Bekam Akhtar and MS Subalakshmi. They were all prominent, and they all acted in films at different times. MS also acted in a film. They were all prominent singers from Tawai backgrounds, or courtesan backgrounds, I should say. Uh, some of these women continued living as Tawaiifs even while working in cinema. I have, I have uh, the names out there in the book. Um, now, the presence of these women, what I'm arguing is that the presence of these women in the production of films, that means, again, they were working with male producers, directors, scriptwriters, singer, uh, singers, etc., as colleagues. They're all working together in the studio, right? So just as the courtesans worked with the poets as colleagues, they continue to do that in the 20th century. And that influences the male directors and male scriptwriters and songwriters, uh, and also influences the idea of gender and sexuality in the movies. Um, the courtesan character the, in films is one of the most distinctive features of Bombay cinema and that's why I don't like to use the word Bollywood, because Bollywood suggests it's an imitation of Hollywood, and it's not, because it has features that are totally missing in Hollywood. Um, for instance, the courtesan figure is so prominent in Bombay movies, and there's no such figure in, in, I could give other examples, but this is one. And this really distinguishes Bombay cinema from other bodies of world cinema, whether you look at Japanese or French or uh, Hollywood or any. Uh, these courtesan characters are arguably the first group of modern women. They are the first group of women shown earning their own living, traveling alone, owning their own houses and cars, and making their own decisions, such as whether to live alone or to live with a man, whether to marry, whether not to marry, whether to remain, continue being a performer or not. They are the first single mothers. They are often identified with motherhood and even with Mother India at times. I'll get to that. They are independently mobile. They drive their own cars and travel on their own in a range of vehicles. And I think mobility is very, very important. To show physical mobility on your own, uh, you know, for a woman is very important. Uh, they, whether it's a car or a bullock cart, as you saw in the previous picture, to, or a train. A lot of the wife movies that the wife is on a train. This again reflects real life. The very word the wife derives from the word tof, and that means moving around. Okay, so the highest class of the wives used to be called dere dar, which means they set up encampments wherever they travel to perform. Right, so they traveled extensively, just as the male poets did. Can you go back one, please? Uh, so filmmakers and lyricists. Uh, many of whom were important Hindi and Urdu poets. They were strongly influenced by social reformist and nationalist view of courtesans. So now I'm talking about the movie's attitude to courtesans, to Tawaiyas. It is a kind of a self-contradictory uh, mixed up attitude. On the one hand, being nationalists and social reformers the, and progressives, the, the filmmakers and the lyricists think that it, it must be bad to be a Tawaif, it must be oppressive, it must be exploitation. But they also have personal knowledge of courtesans as very smart and, and confident women. So what do you do with this? So this results in a sort of schizophrenic depiction of courtesans. On the one hand, the Tawaifs in Bombay cinema constantly spout feminist rhetoric about how terrible it is to be a Tawaif. And this starts very early, much before Pakiza, it starts in the 40s and 50s, right? They are oppressed victims, they need to be rehabilitated, men must help them by marrying them and all this kind of stuff. At the same time, they also praise and advertise their charms, and they seem to dance and sing with a lot of enjoyment. So they're doing both the things. Um, in movies of the 40s and 50s, you have some of these Tawaif characters who show no interest in marriage at all. Um, they, instead, they have an assertive sexuality pursuing the object of their desire. Uh, such as there's a Tawaif character in Shire, 1949, she's and her name is Meena Kumari, and she's a stage dancer, and she's clearly Tawai of Tawaif antecedents. What she does is she writes letters to her male admirers in pre days. She writes letters to them, corresponds with them. She invites them to visit her in Mumbai. She sends photos of herself to them. So she's advertising herself. And when they come to Mumbai, some, some Lala, some Seth comes to Mumbai, one of her clients. She picks them up in her own car and then drives them to her home and hosts them in her very palatial home. Uh, so the, another character is this one, uh, Amita in Bank Manager 1959. Now she's at a Mushaira in this picture. She's the only woman poet at the Mushaira. She sings uh, the very famous song, Sabah Se Keh Do. Now, I had heard this song for years, and I had no idea that it's a woman singing to a man, it's a Tawaif singing to a man. Uh, uh, you know, you, you just don't know that. She addresses it to the hapless bank manager. The name of the film is Bank Manager. So as the bank manager enters the room, she raises one eyebrow slightly and looks directly at him. Just go to the next. As the camera moves, so here she is looking at him. The camera moves between her face and his, and she keeps on smiling and looking directly at him. Go to the next. While his lips are slightly open, and he looks like 
totally dazzled, delighted, but he doesn't know what to do with this. So uh, like a typical romantic hero, hero who woos a girl, Amita goes and waylays him at the railway station as his wife leaves. He's gone to the railway station to leave his wife. As his wife leaves, she goes there and picks him up in her car. She's in fashionable modern dress, much more fashionable than the wife. She's wearing sunglasses. She gives him a lift in her convertible. She asks him, sit closer to me, and then she offers to show him the sights of Lucknow. So then, of course, he's, all, he's lost. Um, now, this reversal of roles, which she is driving him in the car, this is seen in many the wife movies, and she, this continues throughout their relationship. So courtesans are depicted as women who pursue the objects of their desire instead of waiting to be wooed, unlike most romantic heroines. Not all, but most. So go to the next one, Kalapani. Uh, you have the courtesan who is ready to financially support her lover, right? And in this film, she continues, I, I don't know how many people have seen it, but at the end of the film, she continues being a courtesan. Uh, she does not uh, marry, she does not die, which is the typical ending of uh, the wife movies, but she continues being a courtesan. Um, she, now the kind of eroticism which is modeled by the courtesan, uh, you know, here you see, uh, is she, she, is she, you know, the various elements of eroticism, of Shringar, one can say, which are wine and pan and gajra and gungurugon. Um, these draw on, in the movies, these draw on very long traditions of constructing the erotic, keep going, seen in texts like the Kama Sutra, keep going. Um, so this is what I wanted to show. So, show. so gajra, gunguru, uh, wine, pan, items of self-adornment, these are found in the Kama Sutra and medieval painting, they are found in forms like the Sarapa. And this, so what I'm saying is that movies continue the traditions of the erotic and transmit them to a very wide audience. A lot of people who would, uh, much beyond the elite, who would never have had access to these, people who don't read the Kama Sutra and won't, or listen to medieval, or listen to Urdu poetry, they would, now they get, uh, you know, it's not just classical music and dance, but access to this, these erotic traditions. And many modern Indians, I would say, across class, caste, gender, region, religion, we get our ideas of history, our ideas of classical music and dance, and of love and desire from films. Uh, and what is often lost sight of is that courtesans' ways of loving and desiring influence the construction of eroticism in films, including conjugal eroticism, and that, that I argue in the book. Um, Cinema, in fact, shows the parallels between courtesans and domestic women, Sharif and Tawaif, very much as earlier Lucknow poets broke down that Tawaif-Sharif divide by showing that they have many preoccupations in common. If you read the 18th century poetry by poets, they show that both Tawaif and Sharif women, they go shopping, they buy jewelry, they enjoy poetry, they have love affairs, they have friendships. You can't really tell the difference. And movies also to a lesser degree. Mo these movies of the 50s and 60s also do that. So, uh, you know, film, film uh, theorists have constructed this opposition between vamp and romantic heroine. They say that up to the 70s, 80s, that was. I totally disagree with it. And in my book, I sort of demonstrate that the courtesan figure is depicted as a woman with an assertive sexuality but not a vamp uh, not because vamp is identified with a sort of westernized woman and she's never she's nevertheless usually a good person she's a good person shown as a usually shown as a good person but she has a public presence she's not sharif in that sense right so she really breaks down that divide or uh, challenges it um, okay so uh, a couple of few, few more things that happen that the courtesan characters model for modern Indian for modern Indians is sort of cutting edge ideas of friendship and family. Uh, they are shown developing egalitarian collegial relationships with men, much as they did in real life. In Kalapani, you see this: the courtesan and the poet working together in the kota, writing poems, uh, dancing to poems, and so on and so forth. Um, they also create alternative families. Uh, of course, Bombay cinema has a very long tradition of showing dysfunctional families that don't work. And the film starts by the whole family breaking up, right? And uh, the male protagonist, what he often does, Amitabh is a typical one, Shah, Shah Rukh Khan has also done this, replaces the conventional family with an alternative family, which he makes himself, right? With adopted, adopting brothers, adopting mothers, adopting sisters. Early film of this kind is Dosti, 1969. Um, this continues right through the Rajesh Khanna and Amitabh eras into the Shahrukh era. Chalte Chalte is an example. Uh, but the heroine, because she is a domesticated Sharif woman, she can she can very rarely form alternative families because she can't live with strangers like that, right? So she can't live. Uh, the courtesan heroines constitute an important exception. So go on. The courtesan protagonist often creates alternative families. Just keep going, keep going, <coughs> um, keep going, uh, <coughs> keep going. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, she often creates alternative families. In Gomti Ke Kinare, uh, she adopts a child. She meets in a temple as her son, 
I don't know. Uh, yeah, this is it. I couldn't get the picture of her adopting the child, but she, this is the one in Gumti Ke Kinare, played by Meena Kumari. She adopts a child, then she adopts a petty thief. Here she is with the child. She adopts a petty thief as her adopted brother. They live together all their lives and raise that child together. So you have this family. None of them are biologically related to each other, nor are they married. And at the end of the time, they get their son married. Then they, when they arrange his marriage, then they face some uh, problems. That in Dream Girl, 1977, the, the wife heroine, which is Hema Malini, and her adopted brother, they again raise a whole bunch of orphans together. I couldn't get a good picture, but this is it. In Amar Prem, keep going, the courtesan heroine forms an alternative family by nurturing an abused and neglected child, and also nurturing a man who is neglected by his adulterous wife. Um, so, several cinema critics claim that Bombay movies from the 40s to 80s are dominated by male protagonists and that it's only with people like Madhuri Dikshit that the woman-centered uh, woman film comes to the fore. Again, I disagree with this. Uh, why is it that critics say this? Because they usually ignore the Tawaif heroines. They view the wives almost like a third category, neither man nor woman, and so they just don't notice that these women are the, also he are the uh, central characters in films. Another thing that has happened is that a couple of films, basically Umrao Jan and Pakiza, have drawn attention away from the numerous films that consistently over the decades were female-oriented and female-dominated, which featured courtesans in leading or prominent roles. Sangharsh, for example, 1968 is one of many examples, where the Hindu courtesan from Banaras dances at the court of Wajid Ali Shah, and then she later works in Kolkata. She's moving around. She owns a grand house. She gives shelter to her male lover and to her friends, and a bullying suitor tries to tell her what to do and she tells him this is my house and I'll keep whoever I want here. Um, and for this is the reason why almost every major female actor has played the courtesan role. Uh, Vaijanti Mala, Hema Malini, Meenakshi Seshadri, Smita Patil played it many times. But even others who didn't play it many times, they played it at least once because it, it gave a chance to be in a female-oriented, female-dominated film. Um, Courtesans also represent the religious hybridity of the nation. Uh, we hear a lot about composite culture and syncretic culture of the past. In fact, such culture, when you study the period, such culture was confined to certain limited spaces, very limited spaces. In most spaces, Hindus, Muslims, and Christians, they coexisted, but in many ways, very separately. Kothas were among the few truly composite spaces. And here, Bombay films do a true-to-life depiction when they show Hindu and Muslim women living together, entering into cross-religion liaisons, entering into cross-religion marriages, meeting men of many communities. It's not just that the women themselves are, are having a composite culture, but that the men, the clients who come to the Kota, and you have many scenes like this, the clients who come repeatedly to the Kota, they also meet each other, and they become friends with each other, right? The men as well. And the men are also from all communities. I don't know if you remember. Uh, 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 scenes like this where they are de where it's depicted very deliberately where you'll have the Lalaji and the Muslim with the cap and the Parsi and another man in a hat who was a Christian or whatever. So they're showing you the people from different communities and this is a true to life uh, depiction. Um, a very interesting thing is that almost every group of characters in Bombay movies, whether they are your hero's neighbors or the friends or the servants, they can be identified by name as Hindu or Muslim or Christian or whatever they are or Sikh. But there's a large group of the wife characters who cannot be identified by religion because they have indeterminate standalone names like Piari, Chameli, Dudulari, Gulab, etc. And this again is very true to life in the 18th, 19th, early 19th centuries. It's true that they had names like this. Um, and they wear all kinds of dresses. They wear sari. They wear the same woman wears sari, peshwa, sometimes bindi, sometimes no bindi. Therefore, you can't identify her by religion. Uh, so what I have argued is that film theorists have incorrectly identified the wives with Islam and Islamic culture. And I counted in 147 films from 1939 to 2015, I found 142 Hindu Tawais, 59 Muslim, and 56 indeterminate whom you couldn't tell if they were what, what their religion was. So they cons those constitute 22% of the total. But Hindu Tawais are clearly the majority. So, uh, okay, there's uh, more to say, but maybe I should, I'll just end with Burning Train, which is one of my favorites. Uh, anyone has seen this film? Um, and yeah, there's this lovely little vignette. It's just a little vignette here. Now, when I said that the wife sometimes are identified with Mother India, that's why I'm ending with Burning Train. So as you know, keep going, uh, Nargis, who in real life was the daughter of the wife, keep going, is Mother India uh, in the film of that name. But keep going. Courtesans can also be in films. A courtesan character can also be identified with the symbol of Mother India. No, don't go that much. Go back too, please. Uh, so this is the 1980 film, go one forward, The Burning Train. And this is Mamal Prem. But here also she's identified with a lot of goddess figures. But go ahead. 
Uh, they are. Now, a Tawaif called Ramkali, she just gets onto the train for a little while and she leads the passengers in a song. And the song is very interesting because it is full of radical sentiments concerning sexuality. Uh, so it begins as this sort of philosophical meditation on the brevity of all things. Pal do pal ka saath hamara, pal do pal ke yara ne hai, is manzil pe milne wale, us manzil pe kho jane hai. Okay, you understand? Do I need to translate? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, and then she goes on to say that, that suddenly this gives, this is sort of a melancholy kind of refrain. Then there's a peppy pian to hedonism. There's this Nazro ke shokh nazrane, honto ke garam paimane, hai aaj apni mehfil mein. Kal kya ho koi kya jane, ye pal khushi ki jannat hai, is pal mein ji le divane, aaj ki khushia ek hak. You understand? Today's joys are real, tomorrow's joys are a dream. So it's very carpe diem kind of, seize the day, seize the hour. But the interesting thing is that this song, normally in a kota, the tawaif would sing the song and the men would be watching. But here you have the whole mixed crowd, including people of all religions, which are very, again, deliberately shown, including many middle class women, join the song and sing and dance along with the song. So what is happening is that the philosophy which courtesans, their business was purveying pleasure, the philosophy which had, they had long espoused of seize the day and enjoy yourself now, hedonism, is sort of put forward as an anthem for the modern nation. Here you can see a little bit of them, okay? The culmination is very daring. It is, dosto apna to yahi maan hai, जो भी जितना साथ दे एहसान है उम्र का रिश्ता जोड़ने वाले अपनी नजर में दीवाने हैं ओके सो फ्रेंड्स आई थिंक वी शुड बी ग्रेटफुल टू हुएवर गोज अलोंग विथ अस फॉर हाउ एवर लॉन्ग दोज हु फॉर्म रिलेशनशिप्स फॉर लाइफ आर क्रेजी ओके सो द नाउ शी इज हियर व्हाट शी इज सजेस्टिंग इज व्हाट आई कॉल्ड सीरियल मोनोगामी द कोर्टेजन्स ट्रेडिशनल वे ऑफ लाइफ हुएवर गोज विथ यू फॉर हाउ एवर लॉन्ग इज बीइंग सजेस्टेड एज अ पॉसिबिलिटी फॉर एवरीवन फॉर द मॉडर्न नेशन राइट नाउ द ट्रेन गेट्स सेट ऑन फायर एंड ऑल द पैसेंजर्स आर टोटली टेरिफाइड एंड दे सिंग अ वेरी डीपली क्रिश्चियन सॉन्ग तेरी हैज अ मीन तेरा आसमान व्हिच इज लेड बाय द क्रिश्चियन school teacher and her group of uniform school children in a very gloomy way. Now, you could argue that, okay, this carpe diem hedonism of the first song is erased by this monotheistic pietism of the second song in which the Tawaif also joins, but without any flirtatious gestures or expressions. Um, so here you could say the nation is leaving behind a pre-colonial philosophy of pleasure symbolized by the Tawaif and is embracing a colonial and post-colonial didacticism symbolized by the school teacher. This is one possible reading. But you could also read the two songs as balancing one another and including the two dimensions of the Indic civilizational ethos. And the most important thing is that the climactic moment comes when the railway authorities ask the passengers to throw a red cloth, cloth off the train to show that they are receiving the radio messages. There's a newlywed bride and she refuses to give her red dupatta because she says a symbol of my suhag. Then Ramkali offers her own red sari, which she takes off herself. And this is a sort of, I studied this as a kind of dignified rewriting of Draupadi's disrobing. And she says that life is more important than honor and modesty. She shows that. So she becomes a model for others to imitate. And uh, for example, another Sikh has asked to give his turban as a seat belt for the children. And his wife is shocked and says, how can you ask a Sikh to take off his turban? And he says, well, our gurus gave their heads for others. Can't I give my turban? But this comes later. First, she gives her red sari. And after giving up her sari, she remains in petticoat and blouse, and several times she's seen holding a baby which has just been given birth, uh, just been born on the train. Obviously, the train symbolizes India. It has all this mixed population in it. And so she, it suggests a sort of a new mother India. Uh, it, the term is not used, but I am saying that it suggests a kind of new mother India. Um, so I would end by saying that it's in part thanks to courtesan characters in films that from the early 20th century onwards, modern Indians have not ever found it impossible to imagine women as educated, accomplished, independent earners, single women, and uh, so on. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, if anyone has any question or comments, please feel free to ask. We have five minutes or so. Yes. No, they go back. The Nagar Vadhu, I didn't talk about the films which are based in ancient India, but uh, you, they are there in ancient Buddhist texts and the Kama Sutra and ancient Hindu texts. The Nagar Vadhu, that idea of the courtesan is not the idea, the reality of the courtesan. It goes back to very ancient times. And uh, it keeps changing, and you have different type of courtesans in different um, uh, societies and different eras, but definitely they were attached to Hindu courts in the ancient period as well. And we have historical attestation. And the two, the two or three films also, Amrapali is an example of a film made of this kind. So, yeah. Okay. Yes. So, um, if Kurzas had held such a uh, position of power and respect, 
why, which aspect of the patriarchy led them to uh, not have that kind of uh, position in society anymore? No, any, any, I wouldn't say that they have power of the same kind that men have power. They don't have power, obviously, as the Nawab or the King or the Maharaja has power. It's not the same sort of power. Um, but it is a kind of, and it's not an absolute independence either, because they're dependent on patrons, right? But it is a relative. It's, everything is relative. All power is relative. And so it's a relative power and a relative independence. And owning property is an example of that relative, in their own names is an example of that. Because apart from queens and noble women, other women didn't own property in their own names. So owning property in their own names, writing poetry themselves, that sort of thing. And uh, I don't know what aspect of the patriarchy. I kind of described to you what happens with the British, with the coming of the British, and with the dissolution of the courts. So when the court system, the patronage system goes away, then they have to find uh, what are they then to do. So either they have to marry, some do that. So either they have to become sex workers, some do that. They descend and sink into poverty. And then some of them join the theater and cinema, and they've managed to adapt to the modern period and find patrons, the, the people as patrons after that, the audiences as patrons after that. So many things happen, but yeah. It's such a like component of European society, obviously, and they've always also been a part of Indian society. That at what point did this like severe shame culture begin? And also, isn't it kind of interesting how like we have we do have a lot of people who will like praise and preach Indian history and this and that, but we conveniently do choose to omit courtesans out of that said Indian history, and we also completely choose to like like I mean a lot of people they we do omit them from our mythologies and from our culture, and there's a lot of shame associated with that. But if you're talking like post-colonialization, then I'm just a little confused because our colonizers also did have this in their society. So mm -hmm. when did this whole shame culture thing begin? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You spoke about the importance of Kurna in the um, Bombay cinema in the past. Do they still hold that importance right now in the current uh, era? Uh, one more, yeah. Um, what would you say is the main difference between courtesans in the 18th century and courtesans now in the 21st century? Like, what are the main changes? Do they need to adapt to modern society? Okay, courtesans now don't exist as courtesans in that sense. Very few. If they exist, they're very few. Uh, now they've moved and morphed into others. Uh, a good book called Kothagoi, recently written in Hindi. There's another earlier book called Kothi Ye Kothe Waliya in Hindi. And Kothagoi, he shows how some of the courtesans train the bar dancers. So it becomes a whole different way of performing and a whole different lifestyle. But there's some relationship as well. So in B and this is Bihar based rather than uh, UP based, which is why my study was in UP. But um, so that's one thing. And then the shift in terms of where, when does it come? As I said, in India, and you can't say that it happens in Europe. All lines, as I said, in England, uh, I think the shift comes with the so-called Victorian period. That is when Victoria actually comes to the throne, and it, uh, thereafter. So it is in the second three, second two thirds of the 19th century that the shift begins to slowly happen. Because if you can, you can see it. I have a whole other section on men's dress and on the attitudes to pleasure in uh, both in England and in India before that. In the 18th century, it's very different. The way men dress in color and wearing jewelry and cosmetic, all that disappears gradually in the 19th century. Everyone goes into black suits, and everyone is all about. Saving money and making money, uh, and not about pleasure and being a spendthrift, right? Being a dandy, being a rake, all that disappears for men as well. It's not just for women. So that happens in England. In France, it's somewhat different. As I said, I gave you the example of that courtesan who, right, goes on to the early 20th century. So in France, it's a different, a somewhat different atmosphere. In India, I think it's after 1857 when the courts are smashed. You know, the, when once you lose, uh, there's a tremendous smashing of morale both for Muslims and Hindus when the, the rebellion is crushed and they feel we cannot any longer, we can't fight against them, we lost this battle, so now we have to become like them in order to win. To become like them, you have to remake yourself as Victorians, modern Victorians, which they try to do with some success, with big success, but they try to do that. Um, and that, so I think from 1857 onwards, you can very clearly see it in the literature, the attitudes to love, to wine, to, not just to courtesans, to love, to wine, to sexuality, to everything, you can see the change. In Azad's history of Urdu, for example, he clearly loves the poetry about love and wine and so on, but he says we can't write, write like this anymore, we must write like Wordsworth about nature and social reform, because that is what will get us independent. We can't be writing about love and mind forever and be sunk in that, so we must get rid of that. That's one example. There are much more harsher examples as well. But uh, literally, a lot of this poetry literally disappears. A lot of the poetry I examine in gender, sex, and the city is just lost. It's either totally lost, or it's in libraries. Sometimes it's rescued from a second-hand shop at the last moment, in one, one case of one manuscript. So this, poet, the, this kind of poetry disappeared. The poetry that talks explicitly about sex and so on, it, it kind of disappears. And what we have instead is 
a highly mystical poetry, even in Urdu, they take out the poetry from, say, from Ghalib and Meer, the kind that is much more Arabicized and Persianized that nobody can understand, and that's the one that becomes much more in the canon and studied in schools and colleges. Same thing with Hindi poetry also. Riti poetry is supposed to be obscene, 18th century, so it is sidelined, and Bhakti poetry is put forward. So the mystical, not that Bhakti poetry can also be very erotic, but you take out the elements which are, the editors do this job of taking out the, the elements which are more mystical or interpreting them as mystical and translating that, teaching that in schools and colleges. Any number of poets just disappear from the canon altogether. In Sharangi, in Rangin has totally disappeared. Jurat, their poetry is not available in print. It's lost in manuscript. So there's a whole systematic process by which this happens uh, to, uh, to the poetry in which, which, which writes about sexuality, including courtesans. So that's... Uh, as far as films are concerned, in the book I do trace the courtesans right up to the 21st century. They're still interesting. The hold of the courtesan on the imagination is so strong that even when the real life courtesan has disappeared, she still keeps appearing in movies. Not in the same number, of course, as in the 50s, 60s, century, but, but uh, uh, even the modern directors who may have never seen a courtesan in their life, they still are portraying, they still have that memory of what they have seen in earlier films. And they, they do portray the courtesan much less realistically because they don't know what this phenomenon is. So now it changes over time. But they still do depict it, and still right, till, until very recent. Yeah, Ishak Zade is an example. Mm. Kalat is an example. Hmm? Madhuri Dixit plays a courtesan in Kalat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, or Deir Ishkia is an example, where she yeah. kind of suggested that she has a courtesan mm. background. It's very clear. It's almost as if to be truly erotic, you have to have a, had some connection to the Tawaif. Right, so it's impossible. I mean, it's, was she at the wife before she married the king? It's kind of suggested, and then she goes back to being a dancing teacher and living in an all women household, right? So. Mass, uh, yes, uh, I have a small question. Uh, do you think there is a modern analog, both uh, socially and in cinema, to the courtesan? Do you identify any particular figure who sort of now increasingly the replacement of the courtesan? Yes, I think modern women of uh, Salim, Salim, this, I, this idea to Salim Kedwa, he said that he knew in his youth, and, and we all know now, uh, single women who live, who entertain men in their apartments, who serve wine, I think serving wine, you know, in the romantic heroine never pours out wine, she pours out tea in movies, but only when <laughs> wine has to be poured, the husband pours it, but the Tawaif pours out wine, that's one of her main things in, in Bombay movies, that's what she does in famous movies with Amitabh and so on. But now you have the modern female intellectual or female professional who lives on her lawn, or with a female friend, or with a sister, or with a male, or has a live-in relationship, pours wine for, for fem has male friendships with men who are not, she's not sexually involved with, lives in secret and all. Now it's part of life. So that the wife has modeled that for a certain kind of urban, not I wouldn't say of course all women, but a certain kind of big city woman who's becoming more and more sort of common and portrayed in films as well. So, yeah. okay, uh, two more questions. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned that the courtesans were present only in the urban setting and not in the rural setting. Was there any particular reason for that? Yeah, it's an urban, sex workers are there both in urban and rural settings, but uh, courtesans are connected to courts, as the name in English suggests, and they are very highly educated and accomplished women. I didn't mention that, but they, they learn the languages, they learn how to read and write, they are very highly educated women. Such women, there'll be no patrons for them in the villages you need. Yeah, you know, so when they, are when they go to the villages, it is when they marry some very rich feudal, uh, some nobleman or somebody, then they may go and live in the village with him. As, as his wife or his uh, junior wife or whatever it is, or, but, or uh, with a Maharaja or something. But otherwise, as in terms of the quota, the whole quota, that has to be in the city because you, the household has to be in the city because there won't be patronage in the village, enough people able to do that, right? Enough educated men interested in this kind of conversation and literary conversation and all that. Man, could so. we also understand these courtesans in terms of uh, socially divided society of India in terms of caste? How are these courtesans, courtesans because of perhaps their identities belonging to particular caste? Is that also a kind of reading that we can perhaps yeah, I guess much more work could be done to look into some. Anna Mokom did some work on that, but that, with which I don't, I don't agree again, because she assumes that they all come from certain castes, but she doesn't have any sources for this except a few British sources, which I don't trust. And uh, I, I don't think that the courtesans all come from so-called lower castes or from specifically any specific caste, just as I don't think they come from any specific religion. I think there's a, there's a mix. There are women who get widowed who come. There are women who are abandoned who come. There are women who are 
Brahmins who come from one there are or whatever. There are women who are raped who join the quotas. There are women who uh, and there's a traditional tawaif. The women they're almost a community or a caste on their own, mm -hmm. and they in fact they have relationships with men of all of different castes and different communities and different religions, right? So the children, the daughters that they have or their children, their descendants would be of very mixed lineage, right? Unlike many people who are getting married who are marrying within their own community, these women are having relationships with Hindus, with Muslims, with people of the Kayas, with Muslims, with everybody. And so the children don't have, they're, they're, they form a community of their own, which is, which is which not of course be a high caste because it is so mixed, but it's a very mixed community. It cannot be, it cannot be pinned down to any one jati. It is not, it can't be. So sorry, mm -hmm. but did we also have a uh, male courtesans who similarly engaged in homoerotic relationships? Because, like, I don't know what that period yeah. of India viewed, mm -hmm. like, like, right. the, like, what lenses they viewed these kind of relationships from. Absolutely, you have dancing boys. They are known as they are dancing boys, and many of these sarapas, the poems in praise of the dancing, like Abru, the poet Abru wrote a po poem in praise of a dancing person, where the gender is not entirely clear, but it seems to me a dancing boy is being praised. But we know for historically that Prakash, for example, he is the uh, lineal descendant, and again, there's a you can trace the descent to uh, Biju Maharaj. Biju Maharaj's ancestor was Prakash, who came from Allahabad to Lucknow and became attached to the court there, and he was a dancing boy. And I'm not saying that he was a courtesan, but many of these dance the dancing boys but also having we know from other sources sexual relationships with men right and so just as and and they, they were also uh, very sought after and they were very uh, they had they were skilled and all that so yeah absolutely yeah Ma'am, from where did you got the inspiration to write a book related on such a topic which was so uh, patriarchy related how did you got the inspiration to write a book on such a topic I told you that we started, I started, I was trying to trace my own uh, interests. It started with same-sex love in India. And then I wanted to look at what was the culture like before the British intervention. Then I looked at Lucknow, gender sex in the city was looking at Lucknow. And I wasn't looking only at courtesans. I was looking at same-sex relationships. I was looking at the whole city, at the idea of shopping and fashion and jewelry and so many things that women were engaging in. Not just Tawais, but Sharif women as well. Then after that, I got interested. I came to know that Tawais play such an important role, which I didn't know. And then I wanted to know after Tawais disappeared, where did they, where did this, where did they go, and where did that kind of eroticism go? And then I found cinema as one place. That's why I studied cinema. So it has been a kind of. Yeah. Ma'am, just a yeah, question. Okay. Ma'am, in the past, uh, we all know that there was this custom of devdasis. Mm -hmm. At one uh, point of time, devdasis were just considered to get wedded to the uh, god and uh, they were just uh, 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 given to dancing in temples. But suddenly devdasis slowly ended up dancing in the courts and courts. slowly began. Mm -hmm. How did this transition take place? I, look, I have to say that it's not my field of expertise because I haven't studied that. But from reading what other scholars have said, they um, uh, they do say they do think that the, that was a British um, mistake to say that devdasis were just attached to temples and to god goddesses. They always had connections to courts and to nobility who were their patrons, and they also lived in matrilineal societies and were quite uh, independent women. So to portray them as just because the word, the word dasi to portray them as some kind of uh, surf and which the British portrayed like these victims. They weren't just victims. They were like the Tawais. They are very much like the Tawais. But I have to say I don't know enough about it. And in Hindi movies there's only one movie, Aista Aista, which depicts this in a very negative way and ends in her suicide. But uh, but it does show a little glimpse of that matrilineal household that they're living in with the aunt and the mother and all that. So it does show that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Ruth, for this very fascinating talk. Uh, Ruth's book is available outside, so fe feel free to purchase it. And thank you so much for coming.